let me turn to the next lectures, lectures 15 through 17. So now, where we're now going to talk about equilibrium. We've already identified that all of us in this room, assuming we have mean variance preferences. That's an that's a important assumption, I grant you. But it's not an unreasonable one. It, it's just, it is an important assumption. We've all agreed that we're going to take on portfolios that lie on that line. And therefore, the portfolio that is the tangency portfolio, I'm going to give it a special name. I'm going to call it M, portfolio M. Okay. What we now know is that given a choice between holding N securities and T-bills versus holding T-bills and a single portfolio, all of you would be indifferent between those two choices if that single portfolio were M, the tangency portfolio. Do we agree on that? OK. So therefore, I could, in principle, construct a mutual fund called M. This mutual fund holds stocks in exact proportion to the weights given by that tangency portfolio. In other words, it is the tangency portfolio. So what that suggests is that all of you in this room would be absolutely indifferent between investing among the end stocks and T-bills on the one hand versus investing in two securities on the other. One security is T-bills, and the other security is shares of mutual fund M. So let me, let me show you where we go next, because we're very close now to the big payoff. We've already identified the tangency portfolio as being special. I'm going to call that portfolio M. And I'm going to argue that everybody in their right minds are going to be indifferent between picking among these two investment opportunities, T-bills and M, versus the N plus 1 investment opportunities of all stocks plus T-bills. OK. It turns out that portfolio M therefore has to be a very specific portfolio. And it turns out that that portfolio is the portfolio of all assets in the entire economy in proportion to their market capitalizations. Now, what I just said is an incredibly deep result. So I don't expect you to just get it. Let me say it again. First of all, I want you to understand it. And then I'm going to try to give you the intuition for it. Okay. If it's true that everybody, not only in this room, but in the world, if everybody in the world is indifferent between investing in those n plus 1 securities and in 2, then we can argue that those two securities play a very special role. In particular, think about what that mutual fund M has to be. Everybody in the world wants to hold M. So you can actually, let's make the, the leap of faith that everybody does hold M. So in other words, now we're in a world where everybody is already mean variance optimizers. And they already hold two assets in their portfolio, the Treasury bill asset and the mutual fund M. So you hold M, you hold M, you hold M, you hold M, you hold M. Everybody holds M. We hold different amounts of it. So as a hedge fund manager, you're holding a large amount of M. In fact, you're, you're holding twice as much M as your wealth allows. And you're borrowing T-bills to do so. Somebody who's very conservative is holding a very tiny little bit of M. Mostly, that person is invested in T-bills. But the point is that every single person's portfolio you look at, when you look at their portfolio, it's M. If that's true, if what I just said is true, what portfolio does M have to be? There's only one that it can possibly be. 
and that is the portfolio of all equities in the marketplace held in proportion to their market value. Do you see the beauty of that? Now let me try to explain it, okay? I hope you understand it. Let me explain it. Why does that have to be? This has to do with supply equaling demand. Now I'm going to make an argument about equilibrium. I haven't done so up until now. Up until now, I haven't said anything about supply equaling demand, but I'm about to do so. If everybody is holding this portfolio M, that's the demand side, right? Everybody is demanding M. On the supply side, I'm assuming that all stocks that are being supplied are held. If all stocks that are being supplied are held by somebody, but if everybody in the world is holding the same portfolio M, when you aggregate all of the demands, so I'm going to add up your demand and your demand and your demand and your, we're going to go through the class and go through the world, we're going to add up everybody's demand. In every single case, your weights are identical. You're holding the same portfolio M. So when I aggregate the entire world and I get the portfolio M, what does it have to equal? It can only equal the sum total of all assets in the world, right? Supply equals demand. And therefore, when I aggregate all of your holdings of M into one big fat M, that big fat M can only be equal to one thing, which is all the equities in the world. And the weightings are just simply their market caps. Right? There's only so much of General Motors. Take the entire sum total of that. That's your, the global investment in General Motors. And then you do that for every single stock. And you divide that by the total market capital of the stock, uh, of all stocks. You get the market portfolio, M. So this shockingly simple but extraordinarily powerful result is due to Bill Sharp. Harry Markowitz came up with portfolio optimization. He applied mean variance analysis to portfolio optimization and argued that everybody has to be on the line. Bill Sharp looked at this and said, aha, if everybody's on that line, that means that everybody's going to be either holding M or T-bills or both. And therefore, the only thing that M could possibly be is the market portfolio. And now we have a proxy for the market portfolio, the Russell 2000 or the S&P 500. In other words, it was because of this particular academic framework that was developed by Harry Markowitz and Bill Sharp and others that indexation and benchmarking came to be. That whole direction of analysis and performance attribution, that came out of this.